sincerely. And of course, we're having technical difficulties, so I apologize for that. Um, we're hoping that people will be able to hear um, Dean Ernst, but we also are recording the CLE. So if you feel like you've missed a bit, um, we will have it recorded and you can uh, review it at a later time. Um, I'll just mention, because uh, I heard somebody asking about where the exhibit is, it's in the State Law Library, which is on the ground level of this building. So if you haven't seen it yet, I encourage you to, to stop down and, and visit. Uh, so I welcome our speaker today. Julia Ernst is the Associate Dean for Teaching and Engagement, and she's also a professor at the University of North Dakota School of Law. Dean Ernst is the author of the article, The Mayflower Compact, Celebrating 400 Years of Influence in U.S. Democracy. You can find a link to her article and her full bio on our website, on our CLE page of our website. So I will turn it over to our speaker. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you very much. Uh, thanks to everyone for being here. Um, and I assume you can still hear me okay. Is that right? I see you putting the microphone down. You're still hearing me all right? All right. Very so. good. Very good. Well, welcome to everyone. Um, I'm so delighted to be here today. So thank you very much for, uh, for joining us to talk about the Mayflower Compact and its impact on U.S. law. Um, the, I, I want to flip over here just a moment um, to reiterate uh, what was mentioned before in terms of the, this wonderful traveling exhibit and encourage everyone to attend. Uh, again, the American Bar Association is hosting uh, or is providing this exhibit. Um, join in the rise of self-governance in American organizing from the Mayflower Compact to the modern day. Uh, and this exhibit uh, is, as you can see here, beginning with the Mayflower Compact and transitioning to the exploration of how American voluntary associations and civil societies are created, built, and sustained over time. The exhibit features content and commentary from the Law Library of Congress's collections, representing organizations from across the nation and across time. The exhibit uh, examines the longstanding impulse of Americans to join together for a common purpose to shape their society through fellowship, charitable and mutual aid, labor unions, emergency services, political reform, and community associations, and the tools they adopted to do so. So again, I encourage you to visit the Minnesota um, State Law Library. You can, again, find information on their website, which you can see here, and the exhibit will be there from the 20th through uh, March 31st. So I, I very much en encourage you to attend. The dean of my law school, Dean Brian Pappas, um, sent me an email this morning uh, mentioning that he saw in uh, the Minnesota lawyer um, that there's also a, a wonderful article that was published on this um, the State Law Library's exhibit. So I encourage all of you to take a look at that article as well. Um, so to dive in to the presentation and give you just a little bit of background, uh, this is my mother. She has actually on the Zoom meeting too. So, uh, so welcome to my mom, uh, Janet Ernst. I, this is a picture of the two of us at the UND School of Law, the University of North Dakota School of Law. Um, I, when I was giving a presentation on the same topic or a similar topic I, in 2019 before COVID, and I gave an, a, a lecture on the Mayflower Compact and the U.S. Constitution. You'll see my mother is wearing um, a, her Mayflower medallion. I, and she is a member, we're both descendants. I, she is a member, as, as, as am I, of the General Society of Mayflower Descendants. Uh, we're both descendants of John Billington, who was one of the strangers who came over the May, on the Mayflower, not one of the original uh, uh, separatist community, the religious community, um, but known as one of the strangers. We'll get into that in just a few minutes. Um, but my mom had uh, been researching um, our ancestry through John Billington um, back to the Mayflower um, for quite a few years. She attended some of the, uh, the national conventions of the uh, Mayflower Society, the General Society of Mayflower Descendants. Uh, and she ascended, uh, attended two of those meetings in 2014 and 2017. And then we were making plans um, based on the article uh, that I'd written. Um, we were making plans to attend the 400th anniversary of the Mayflower uh, landing in Plymouth 
Um, the anniversary was being held in Plymouth and Boston and Provincetown uh, in 2020. And of course, all of that was uh, postponed due to uh, the pandemic. Um, let's see, I'm gonna go ahead and flip through to the internet again here. Um, and again, thank you so much for posting. I didn't know you were going to be posting a copy of my article um, on the, which is published in the North Dakota Law Review on the State Law Library's website, but you can also find it in the uh, University of North Dakota School of Law website as well. Um, at, again, it was published um, in volume 95, issue number one, and you can just click through to it. Um, it is quite long. It's 135 pages, so um, a bit voluminous, but the Mayflower Compact itself is very short. You'll see uh, it fits just on this first introductory page here, and we'll get into the, the text of the Mayflower Compact um, in just a few moments. I, when I came back um, that fall, I again, this the, the rescheduled celebration was in the fall of 2021. And so when I came back, I wrote an article for the Gavel Magazine, which is the magazine published by the State Bar Association of North Dakota. You can see here a statute of Sacagawea, otherwise known as Sacagawea, um, I, who I, is, is very famous and, and um, from this region. And uh, you see the North Dakota Heritage Center here, which is another wonderful place to see many um, fantastic exhibits. So I would commend that to all of you. But I wrote an article in the Gavel Magazine uh, on the 400th anniversary of the first Thanksgiving, um, because of course the first Thanksgiving happened the, ne the next year, 1621. Um, so you can see uh, some of the, the pictures from the celebration, the 400th anniversary celebration. I, the, this is the um, I, uh, Wampanoag, a reproduction of a Wampanoag um, I house here, home here. There's a reproduction of the Mayflower itself. You can see us at the, um, the celebration they had at the uh, Plymouth Patuxet Museum, which I would highly recommend to everyone. And this is a replica of the, um, the Plymouth settlement itself at the Plymouth Patuxet Museum as well. So I would highly encourage um, anyone who is interested to, to go visit uh, Plymouth and the Mayflower. There are a couple, um, I don't know if you can see this, uh, but there are a couple of um, photographs of that my mom found of us in the magazine that came out that um, later that summer, uh, the Mayflower Quarterly Magazine. And you can see here, um, you also can go visit Plymouth Rock. Um, they actually have what they what they believe is Plymouth Rock uh, located in this structure to, uh, to keep it protected, but you can visit that as well. So I encourage everyone to, to take a look at that. So uh, for our roadmap for the rest of our time together today, we're going to get into a little bit more uh, detail about the Mayflower Compact itself um, and uh, what I, how the, the actual words of the Mayflower Compact the, 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 the demonstrated the concepts that really have impacted uh, the course of American history and particularly its legal history and governance. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about Plymouth Colony, uh, about how Plymouth Colony and the Mayflower Compact impacted the other colonies throughout the colonial period. Uh, of course, leading up then to the Declaration of Independence, uh, the American Revolution, um, the U.S. Constitution, and some of the other documents around that time, such as the Articles of Confederation, and then, of course, the evolution of U.S. law, democracy, and in particular, civil society, which is the... Uh, the basis or the, the focus of the exhibit at the Minnesota State Law Library. Um, of course, we need to acknowledge the uh, indigenous inhabitants, the original inhabitants of the Americas um, who had been here from at least 15,000 years or estimates of up to 40,000 years um, ago. And I have, have resided here um, in, in these lands since that time. And uh, to, to acknowledge um, the uh, the first peoples who were here as well, I and and of course I uh, we know the Plymouth uh, the plantation um, the uh, the Mayflower pilgrims they were not certainly not the first who were here the first known European to arrive in the Americas uh, with Leif Erikson um, back between sixteen uh, seven sorry between nine seventy and ten twenty um, he was a Norse explorer from Iceland. Uh, we, of course, know the history with respect to Christopher Columbus um, in 1492, and of course, you're familiar with the, 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 um, I, I, his, his heritage in terms of the, 
a relationship with the indigenous inhabitants, um, the, his use of violence and uh, slavery, the forced conversion of the native peoples to Christianity, um, and the, the decimation that happened with respect to the Native American populations um, upon the arrival of uh, Europeans in general, but um, with Christopher Columbus and his brother in particular as well. Uh, for example, in 1492, when they originate, originally um, arrived, there were uh, estimated about 2,000 sorry, 250,000, about a quarter of a million um, Taino peoples within the islands of the Caribbean. And by the uh, 1550, so just over six decades later, or under six decades later, um, they were almost entirely wiped out, that quarter of a million people, by um, both violence and disease and being taken into slavery. So, so there's that history that we need to acknowledge as well. Um, of course, there was a lot of fishing, a lot of exploration that occurred up and down throughout the Americas, the coast, uh, the, during that time period. So again, we think of the pilgrims as being kind of the first settlers, but they, they certainly were, were not. Um, we, uh, we have, of course, the Europeans, the explorers and um, uh, folks who were fishing, they were interacting a lot with the uh, Native American population as well. And there was, of course, as we acknowledged before, uh, devastation and decimation of the um, Native American population throughout the Americas. There were estimated to be about 60 million inhabitants throughout the Americas um, before the arrival of the Europeans. And about 100 years later, there were down to 6 million. So you can see about 90% of the people who had originally ha inhabited this land um, died through disease and violence and I, uh, taken by enslavement and, and that type of thing too. So again, I want to recognize that as an important part of our history um, to remember and acknowledge. Uh, there were quite a few pre-Plymouth settlements. Uh, this is just one of them, the Lost Colony of Roanoke, uh, which was established in 1585. Uh, so quite a few years before the Plymouth Colony and it disappeared. Uh, no one knows exactly what happened, um, but between 1587 and 1590. Um, during uh, the, the subsequent few decades, of course, we have the reign of King James between 1603 and 1625. Uh, so he was the king during the time uh, when the, uh, they weren't originally called the, the pilgrims. They referred to themselves as the, the separatists um, or the saints. They called themselves the saints. Uh, when they um, were originally, I, I, establishing their own religion, their own religious beliefs, and really going against the hierarchical uh, beliefs with respect to the Church of England. Um, they were, as you know from the stories, they were being persecuted uh, by the Church of England um, and by the authorities there, so uh, so took their leave of England. What many people don't realize is that they originally left England for the first time in 1608 uh, and went to the Netherlands. Uh, the Netherlands at the time was um, uh, had a lot more separation of church and state, a lot more freedom uh, for people within that country at the time. And so the uh, the saints, the separatists originally went there where they were able to practice their religious beliefs freely. Uh, but then after a period of years, they, uh, there was a great fear that war was going to break out uh, throughout Europe and including in the Netherlands. And so uh, the pilgrims decided that the saints were uh, separatists decided to, uh, to embark for the new world. So they, they actually went back to England uh, and prepared to leave England for a second time. Uh, so that they could go to the new world to again, um, practice their religious beliefs um, uh, as they chose. So I, uh, during this time frame, um, as they were preparing to leave the England the second time, they actually were uh, negotiating with the King of England and obtained a patent, the uh, official approval from the King um, to go establish a colony. Originally, um, their patent was to establish the colony in Northern Virginia, not in, uh, in Massa the Massachusetts region, but in Northern Virginia. Um, and they had to obtain financial backing, of course, to be able to make the expensive trip um, all the way to the New World. So they received financial backing from um, a group called the Adventurers, who were basically investors. They sought to profit by funding the colony, its new colony, in exchange for goods that the, the new settlers would be sending back from the New World. Um, so 
in addition to the uh, the pilgrims, in addition to the saints, uh, the separatists, they also needed others to help them support this new colony in the new world um, because they were going to be establishing it uh, in the wilderness without uh, uh, you know, access to the cities that they had been used to to living in and all of the um, the amenities there. So they brought along with them merchants and craftsmen and indentured servants. Uh, they brought some orphaned children. Uh, so there were many among their group who were not uh, within their religious um, community. So uh, they, again, they referred to themselves as the saints, and they referred to those who were not members of their religious community as the strangers. So some of you may have seen uh, some of the um, the films called The Saints and the Strangers or some other um, uh, references to saints and strangers. So that's why uh, the, the, the religious folks were called the saints, um, but the others were called the strangers, but they all came to the new world to establish the new the new colony. Of course, they had some problems as they were departing. Um, they had uh, quite a bit of storms that were knocking them off um, off coast. They had two ships originally that were, that were going, uh, but the Speedwell, um, and actually the Mayflower itself, originally had to go back a couple of times to, to um, have repairs because it was flooding. The Speedwell, the other ship that was originally going to go, ended up turning back and didn't make the voyage. So those who wanted to go on, I, I went on to the Mayflower, and those who wanted to depart um, went over to the Speedwell and went back to England. Um, and of course, with the weather I, having a late start um, in the season, you can see the original um, track they were going the northern parts of Virginia, which at, at that time, the colony of Virginia went all the way up to the Hudson River, which is now part of what we would know as New York. Um, but originally, they were supposed to go uh, much further south, and the storms knocked them off course. They ended up um, up in Cape Cod, as we know. So originally, when they first came to Cape Cod, um, they, the, even though the, the trip was very arduous and, um, uh, and very difficult, they had, uh, they started out, um, with 101 passengers. I, uh, one of those, um, hundred, let's see, 102 passengers. One of them passed away and one was born. There was a child, a baby, Oceanus Hopkins, who was born on the trip. Um, so they ended up with, uh, with, with 102 passengers who ultimately um, arrived in the new world. And um, let's see. So again, they had originally obtained their patent for uh, Virginia, but because of the storms, they were thrown off course uh, because it was beginning to uh, be the stormy season. It was uh, November by the time they reached uh, the new world. They originally attempted to sail south, but they were hitting all sorts of shoals and bad weather and everything. So they thought, oh, they better go back up and go into Cape Cod Bay where they would be protected and to uh, form their settlement there. However, their patent was only for, uh, for going to Virginia, to settle in Virginia. So some of the strangers on board the Mayflower said, well, you know, you the, when they were on board the Mayflower, they were subject to the captain, of course, the law of the captain. But when they would arrive in the new world, there would be no authority over them because the only authority was to settle uh, under the king was to settle in Virginia. And so there was a threat to have a mutiny um, on board the Mayflower. And in fact, um, our ancestor, John Billington, uh, is reputedly one of the ones who threatened to mutiny um, and to leave the colony and say, you know, we're just going to go off and, and leave the, the saints and we're going to um, do our own thing in the new world. And I, uh, however, the, uh, the pilgrims knew, the saints knew that they, that the settlement would fall apart, colony would fall apart if they didn't have everyone pulled together and have all of the, um, the benefit of the, 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 um, skills that the others had been bringing to them. And so before they would allow anyone to disembark, they uh, came up with the Mayflower Compact. And through negotiation, I uh, got everyone to agree to abide by the Mayflower Compact. Um, and so, so this is where um, our family likes to, uh, to lay claim that our ancestor helped to develop the Mayflower Compact, which helped start uh, this, the um, uh, self-governance throughout the colony and then throughout the, the, the uh, legal uh, history of the United States. So something we like to claim. Uh, okay, so we have the Mayflower Compact. You see some of the 
uh, the depictions um, of the, the, the signing of the Mayflower Compact. And this is the document itself. It's not, it's not the, the original document was lost, but it was recorded in William Bradford's um, I, I record of what happened um, in the Mayflower and the, uh, sorry, the Plymouth colony um, throughout the first years. So we know that it was a very, very short document. So this is a replica of it. Um, and you see that there were not 102 people who signed it. Uh, there were only 41 adult males who signed it. Um, the children were not allowed to sign it. Of course, the women were not allowed to sign it, indentured servants, um, et cetera. So, uh, so there were 41 uh, adult males who ended up signing the compact. And again, this is from the, the records that we have. Um, so this is the, the, the language of the compact itself. This is it. It's uh, very, again, very short and sweet. So we'll just uh, read it quickly through. In the name of God, amen. We whose names are underwritten, the loyal subjects of our dread sovereign Lord King James, by the grace of God of Great Britain, France, and Ireland King, defender of the faith, etc., having undertaken for the glory of God and the advancement of the Christian faith and honor of our king and country, a voyage to plant the first colony in the northern parts of Virginia, do by these presents, solemnly and mutually in the presence of God and of one another, covenant and combine ourselves together into a civil body politic for our better ordering and preservation and for the furtherance of the ends aforesaid. And by virtue hereof to enact, constitute, and frame such just and equal laws, ordinances, acts, constitutions, and offices from time to time, as shall be thought most meet and convenient for the general good of the colony, unto which we promise all due submission and obedience. In witness whereof, we have under, here under subscribed our names at Cape Cod, the 11th of November in the year of our reign, of our sovereign Lord King James of England, France, and Ireland, the 18th, and of Scotland, the 54th, uh, Anno Domini, 1620. And then there were the signatures of the, the 41 adult males. So let's take a look at some of these phrases here and how they might foreshadow um, some of the, uh, the, the um, uh, legal history and the governance history within uh, the United States. So, for example, I want to point out a lot of times people think that the, the pilgrims um, were leaving the England and did, you know, were, did not like England and not like the, of course, they didn't like the subjugation uh, and their lack of ability to worship as they chose, but they were very proud to be subjects of Elizabethan England. Uh, remember, at that time, England was, uh, the, the, the um, country itself was booming and they had I, I, a lot of um, I trade, they had a lot of loyalty to their country. They were very proud to be English and English uh, subjects. So they weren't trying to uh, rid themselves of the king. And in fact, they were very uh, dependent on England as well on trade back and forth with England. And they were dependent on the king for their patent, for the ability uh, to actually establish a colony uh, within England. So they were, um, they were very much uh, reiterating that loyalty in the Mayflower Compact. Um, notice that they did not have the separation of church and state within the Mayflower Compact or within their colony. I, the first words were in the name of God, amen, right, of the Mayflower Contact, a Compact. Um, the king was the head not only of state, but also was the head of the church. Uh, he's the def known as the defender of the faith. So the king is the head of the church as well as the head of um, I, of the state of England, the government of England. Um, they explicitly say that they're establishing the colony for the glory of God and the advancement of the Christian faith. Now, notice they did not specifically say the separatist faith, the Church of England. They had, of course, they had to show deference still to England and not make uh, them upset because they, they relied on the trade, et cetera, and their patent. Um, but I, so, so they had this, this, and of course they had the saints as well as the strangers. And so they had among the strangers, many who were uh, loyal members of the church of England, right? So they had to have a broader document that would encompass both the separatists and the members of the church of England. And so I, they, um, and yet they were still acknowledging the, their deference to Christianity and um, the purpose of the colony to uh, establish 
um, a religious colony. I, they actually also acknowledged that their patent was for the northern parts of Virginia. So right, right in the Mayflower Compact, um, they acknowledged they were supposed to be in Virginia, but that they were not, that they were doing this in Cape Cod. So kind of acknowledging that precarious situation uh, in terms of, you know, the, the pre precarious, uh, uh, in terms of whether or not they had authority um, with respect to their governance. And the, the authority of the colonial governance um, of Plymouth Colony was perpetually in question. Um, and they actually never received the, the, a charter that they had continually asked for, specifically granting them a charter for Plymouth Colony versus the northern parts of Virginia. Um, so they also here, I um, talked about establishing a civil body politic uh, instead of a, um, you know, a, uh, ruling themselves through an authoritarian governance structure, um, they were ruling themselves by this consent of the governed. Uh, so they say, by these presents, we all mutually in the presence of God and of one another covenant and combine ourselves into a civil body politic uh, under which we promise all due submission and obedience. So this is the, 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 um, first uh, articulation of the consent of the governed, the importance of the consent of the governed. Um, and uh, interestingly that uh, the social compact and John Locke described decades later, uh, but the Mayflower Compact um, was one of the first to, uh, not the first, to establish the consent of the governed. And they also I uh, were promoting concepts of justice and equality, and that governance is there for the general good of the colony, uh, for the good of the people, um, not just for the good of the king or the monarch, but for the good of the people um, themselves and the good of the whole. So important uh, heritage there as well. And again, we have the signatures of the 41 Males, um, notice again, no women um, uh, were, were allowed to sign the compact as well, of, of course, in accordance with the, the, the times. Now, um, they, uh, not only did they have a very long and arduous and difficult journey, I, however, um, I, enabling everyone to, uh, to survive the journey, I, but they were very, very weakened. This is a, a picture of Plymouth Rock here, what is what is thought to be what's left of Plymouth Rock. Over the years, it has been, um, chips have been taken off of it, and that's why they have this big structure over the rock now, so that people can't go and desecrate it, because um, over the years, a lot of people had, had taken pieces of Plymouth Rock. Um, but they suffered great hardship that first winter. It was a very, very harsh winter. Um, many people got sick, and many people died over that first year, the first winter. Um, at several points, there were only about six people who were well enough to continue working and to continue to try to take care of the people in the colony. Um, and by the end of the winter, only about half of the people survived. So the one, according to one account, only 47 of the original 102 settlers were still alive. And over half of that number were children. Over half of them were under the age of 18. Um, so, uh, so it was a very, very devastating winter. And again, many of the original uh, other colonies who had tried to establish uh, were not successful and were not able to establish as colonies. Remember the lost colony of Roanoke, many others had not survived as well. Uh, so it was very um, much in question whether the colony of Plymouth would survive. Uh, but at the end of that winter, um, when they were able to leave, the crew who had also many of the crew had gotten sick, though, so they had to stay. They weren't able to make the trip back in November. Um, they departed uh, in April of 1621. And Governor George Carver, who was originally elected as governor, um, he passed away that spring, and Governor Bradford was elected as the new governor of Plymouth Colony. And he uh, actually was the governor of Plymouth Colony for about 30 years. So it had a very long reign there. Um, note that uh, instead of electing their, uh, their senior elder and religious leader, William Brewster, um, they elected I, uh, both John Carver and uh, William Bradford as um, secular leaders of the colony. Uh, they could have established someone who would be kind of the, the, the um, leader of both 
the theology and the uh, democracy and William Brewster, but they chose not to do that. They chose not to establish a theocratic government, which uh, again, they had in England because the king was the head of the church and the state. They chose not to have a theocratic government, um, but instead decided to have a civil government. Um, likewise, they could have chosen uh, the, the military um, uh, leader, Miles Standish, I was the, the renowned military leader within Plymouth Colony, but they did not select Miles Standish. They did not want to have a military rule um, or an authoritarian government or a government ruled by um, military force. They wanted, again, a civil government. Um, of course, you're familiar with uh, some of the history with respect to the interaction between the pilgrims and the Native Americans. Um, uh, the first contact, uh, the first interaction, of course, they had seen some Native Americans, there were some, some squabbles and that type of thing. Um, but the first actual contact uh, that they made with the Native Americans was when Samoset um, arrived, uh, came to the settlement um, and spoke to them in English. His first words were reportedly, welcome Englishmen um, in March, of, uh, March 16 of 1621. So I uh, made contact with them and then introduced them to, um, to the Wampanoag. Um, you might know the history too, uh, the stories about Swanto, who is another Native American who knew a bit of English as well, and who lived with the, the uh, settlers for quite some time and helped them, really helped them survive, helped them learn the planting um, methods that would work in, the, in New England the New England region, uh, teaching them how to plant, uh, how to harvest, um, how to grow their crops, et cetera, and uh, prevented even more tragedy uh, from happening than, than that had happened that first winter. Um, and of course, you know, the, there's there's quite a bit of uh, mythology that's arisen around that, that quote, Thanksgiving. Um, that I they they what what I according to the two accounts the two firsthand accounts that we have of of what is now known as the first Thanksgiving there were just two brief paragraphs and again I summarize those in my article in the the State Bar Association of North Dakota's Gavel Magazine um, and I those accounts were that it was basically. Um, like a harvest festival, the uh, Squanto had introduced um, or had been uh, helping negotiate between the pilgrims and the Wampanoag, um, and particularly their chief, Chief Massasoit, um, and they they uh, came to an agreement to a treaty uh, of mutual uh, respect and protection, um, particularly against the Narragansett, who were uh, in in uh, quite a few squabbles with the the Wampanoag. So they had a peace treaty with the Wampanoag and Chief Massasoit and about 90 um, uh, other people I uh, arrived at the Plymouth settlement and brought quite a bit of the, the provisions, quite a, quite a bit of the food. Um, and really it was around that harvest festival time um, that they had this celebration for, um, for several days. So that was the, the account of the first Thanksgiving. Now the Plymouth colony then um, again started off uh, very small, uh, but gradually became more established. New people continued to arrive. Some of the first settlers went back to England, uh, but uh, quite a few of them stayed as well. The colony eventually grew uh, and became more profitable, and they continued to seek an official charter from the king. Um, we had King Charles then, who, who ascended to the monarchy in 1625, um, and uh, the settlers again continued to seek an official uh, sanction of their being in Plymouth in, in um, Massachusetts versus in Virginia where they were originally supposed to be located. Um, but they, they continued to grow and continued to uh, become much more sophisticated. Uh, in 1636, so about 16 years after they first arrived, um, they established the Pilgrim Code of Law. So this was their first written code. Um, in the beginning, the laws of the Plymouth Colony were developed by the, what's called the General Court. So basically their General Assembly. Um, but in 1636, they wrote down these laws that they had developed um, into a code, the Pilgrim Code of Law. And some view this as the first written constitution in America. So again, some people will account the Plymouth Compact as the first written constitution, although it was very, very skeletal. Um, others uh, deem the Plymouth Code of Law 
uh, as the first written constitution in America. And it basically outlined the frame of government for the colonies. So again, it sounds very much like a constitution establishing the frame of government um, and including the beginnings of the separation of powers and some basic rights and limitations, rights of the people and limitations on the powers of government. Um, so for example, the code levied taxes, I, I decreed distribution of land, uh, it set out punishments for specific crimes. It included a rudimentary bill of rights and, for example, guaranteed trial by jury. Um, and it also, interestingly, made specific reference to the um, Mayflower Compact. So you see here in the second sentence of the Plymouth Code, um, it's known as in, in history, historically, as the Plymouth Agreement or the um, Mayflower Combination or Compact. Um, but they say right here in the Plymouth Code of Law, this is a quote, uh, now being assembled uh, in accordance with the said order and having read the combination made at Cape Cod on the 11th of November, 1620. Again, referring back to the Mayflower Compact. Uh, and then it goes on and, and uh, also talks here about the consent of the governed. So it says no imposition, law or ordinance made uh, be made or imposed upon us by ourselves or others at present or to come, but such as shall be made or imposed upon us by consent. So again, here's that framework for the consent of the governed. And of course, this, this does go back, harken back to uh, some of the rights that were established um, under previous documents, such as the Magna Carta uh, back in um, 1215. So there was um, some history and through some of the religious organizations, particularly with respect to the separatists, um, more of an equality of governance within the separatist um, religious uh, organizations and entities as well. So, uh, so there was some, some background for this, but again, it ensconces this uh, right of the consent of the governed. Um, again, going on, talks a little bit about the taxes uh, um, being equal, the levy shall be equal, talks about the governor needs to swear an oath to faithfully, equally, and indifferently administer justice. So again, ensconcing this concept of equality um, of everyone within the, the colony. Um, it says each assistant to the governor shall swear an oath to faithfully, truly, and justly uh, assist the governor. So again, ensconcing, oh, without partiality, this is kind of hidden under my screen, but without partiality. So again, ensconcing those, those uh, uh, concepts of equality um, within the Plymouth Code of Law. So again, uh, in the Plymouth Colony, again, uh, we think of the pilgrims as establishing religious freedom. Uh, and of course, uh, they were trying to leave England because of religious persecution so that they could be free to practice their own religion. Um, and actually within Plymouth Colony, the, uh, the settlers uh, and the governance of Plymouth Colony were much more tolerant of others, uh, of other religious beliefs, of other faiths, as we talked about before, tolerant of those who still believed in the Church of England. Um, there was talk in uh, 1645 about a proposal um, in Plymouth Colony accepting uh, Jews, Catholics, Unitarians, and other sects uh, sects of uh, religion to be accepted by Plymouth Colony. So there was um, there was quite a bit of religious tolerance, um, particularly in light of the religious intolerance that was the norm at the time. Um, and we'll talk about some of the other colonies, both. Uh, in terms of religious tolerance and freedoms, and also some who were not as tolerant uh, in a moment. Um, so Plymouth Colony over time grew substantially. By 1640, they had around 1,000 people, again, starting from about 42. At the beginning, uh, by, uh, by um, 1643, they had around 2,000 people. By the mid 1640s, they had around 3,000 people. So you can see it growing. Um, of course, as they're growing, they're continuing to bump up against the, um, the territory of the Native American uh, societies as well and their territories. Um, however, originally for that first around 50 years, they were largely peaceful um, relationships between the, the pilgrims and the, the Native Americans in the region. One exception is, there were several exceptions, but one exception is that what known as the Pequot War, um, of 1637, where um, settlers, again, there were more settlers around at the time, 
Uh, but settlers, including some of the pilgrims from Plymouth Colony, massacred uh, between 400 and 700 women, children, and elderly men while the warriors were away from their, from their um, Native American settlement, um, and they sent others as slaves to the West Indies. However, um, their religious leader, John Robinson, who had remained back um, in England, sent, uh, they communicated, continued to communicate back and forth, and he roundly condemned uh, any violence against the Native American peoples. And so generally, the Plymouth colony was, um, was largely peaceful for that first um, 50 years or so, entering into treaties and, and respecting those treaties largely uh, for that first um, time. However, over time, um, the what, what are called the old comers or the old timers, the ones who originally settled in the colony, who were very religiously um, fervent and dedicated, over time, um, they regretted the loss of that religious fervor among their, their community with the newcomers and with their progeny, with their children who were less interested in religious fervor. Um, and many were much more interested in economic improvement. For example, some of the others who came to the new world. Um, and so they were uh, known as um, the, the, the newer ones or the next generations were, I, I, according to to this hungry for land and displacing, um, wanted to displace more of the Native American population. So that led up to the um, what's known as King Philip's War, um, who was a, a, a Massasoit's, uh, Chief Massasoit's um, son. And there was the, the war between 1675 and 1678 about 55 years after the, the pilgrims landed, which was completely devastating and basically wiped out uh, the Wampanoag and um, those who remained alive were were deprived of their re remaining land. So again, the colonies, as you know, were expanding and expanding um, as more people were moving from um, England and from other regions of, of Europe into, um, into the New World. There are actually only two manuscripts uh, that provide um, firsthand accounts, um, primary accounts, of Plymouth Colony. And the one is of, called Of Plymouth Plantation, which was the writings of William Bradford um, describing the, the history of the settlement over that time period. The other is called Mort's Relation, a journal of the Plymouth. And it's unknown exactly who wrote this, but there are, um, it's often attributed to Edward Winslow, who's one of the original uh, um, pilgrims in Plymouth Colony. I, and as you all know, um, Plymouth Colony eventually was absorbed into uh, the Massachusetts Bay Colony, which then became the state of Massachusetts. Um, in 1691, uh, Plymouth Colony was officially dissolved, um, and their uh, their grant of their charter um, was was taken away, and it was absorbed into the larger Massachusetts Bay Colony. So P Plymouth Colony only lasted between 1620 and 1691. Um, and I, I'll, I'll point out that Bradford um, only references the term pilgrim um, once in kind of a, a brief aside uh, in the Plymouth Plantation. Again, they did not refer to themselves as pilgrims, um, but 200 years later after they landed, um, the, the famous orator Daniel Webster I spoke on the anniversary, the 200th anniversary of the Pilgrims landing. He spoke of the Pilgrim Fathers and uh, at that bicentennial celebration. And really that's when the term Pilgrim entered into common usage and now kind of refers to all of the, both the saints and the strangers, everyone who settled in Pilgrim uh, in, in Plymouth Colony. Um, so of course the there was a lot <laughs> of other, uh, there were a lot of other things that were going on um, up and down at the East Coast uh, during the time that uh, the, the Plymouth Colony was being established as well. Um, there were many more settlers who were colonizing the so-called New World. The Dutch settled around the, uh, the New York um, area, which eventually became called New York. Uh, there were individual proprietorships. For example, William Penn founded Pennsylvania based on uh, concepts of religious freedom and consent of the governing principles of equality. Uh, there were the joint stock companies um, uh, originally found in Virginia, so for more for economic reasons. Um, so a lot was going on. And 
Again, I'm going to turn to Virginia. I, you know that the name Virginia was named after the region, was named after Queen Elizabeth, the Virgin Queen, uh, who reigned between 1558 and 1603. I, and the colony of Jamestown, the settlement of Jamestown, was named after King James, who again reigned between 1603 and 1625. Um, so with the history of Jamestown, they have a strong history, too, in terms of the, the governance um, and history of governance in the United States. In fact, I, a year before the, the pilgrims even landed at Plymouth in 1619, um, the House of Burgesses was established uh, in the Jamestown settlement. So again, Virginia was first settled in 1607. So uh, about 13 years before, even before the, the pilgrims left and uh, went and settled in um, Leiden in the Netherlands. So the House of Burgesses was established um, in 1619 for the guy, for the governing of uh, all of Virginia. And initially, only men of English origin were permitted to vote in the House of Burgesses. Um, however, on June 30th in 1619, that same year, was the first recorded strike in colonial America when the Polish artisans uh, protested that they weren't able to vote and able to participate in the governance. And they refused to work uh, if they weren't allowed to vote. And so in July of that year, very soon after that, the court granted uh, to both Poles and Slovaks um, equal voting rights. So this was the first labor strike in the United States um, in 1619. Of course, during that same year, many of you know uh, through the 1619 project that the first slaves were uh, reported to have been brought to America as well. We don't know if, if slaves had been um, in settlements before that. We know slaves had been on ships uh, that had with explorers going up and down the coast. Um, but the first um, slaves brought to a settlement that are, are known um, were known to have been brought in 1619. Uh, to the, the Jamestown settlement as well. So what was going on in some of the other colonies? Well, we had the Great Puritan Migration uh, that was happening between about 1629 um, to 1640 in Massachusetts Bay Colony, where Massachusetts Bay Colony eventually dwarfed the small uh, Plymouth Colony and eventually absorbed it, took it over. Um, so Massachusetts Bay Colony, you can see it's the great Puritan migration. Um, they established a Puritan governance in Massachusetts Bay Colony. And in fact, it did establish a theocracy unlike the Plymouth Plantation, um, Plymouth Colony. And I, in, for example, in 1632, I, in the Massachusetts Bay Colony, they issued an edict that only members of the Puritan church who were citizens, only members of the Puritan church were citizens and could participate in governance. And that was only about a third of the people in the colony were members of the, the Puritan church. Um, and of course, women and servants and artisans were also uh, not allowed to be involved in governance. So there was even less participation in, in the governance in the Massachusetts Bay Colony. Um, it was, uh, you see the picture of John Winthrop here, who really uh, helped lead this great Puritan migration and, and lead the governance of uh, the Massachusetts Bay Colony. He wrote uh, what was called, kind of ironically, uh, the Book of Liberties, uh, published in 1641. Um, but even within that Book of Liberties, of course, they were talking about liberties for the Puritans, uh, for, for the people who were settling there. But even within that Book of Liberties, um, John Winthrop uh, established right in that Book of Liberties, the legalization of slavery within the colony. And um, that uh, there was a Book of Laws that was adopted in 1648, which was based on that, uh, the, the Book of Liberties. Um, and notably, at the time the US Constitution was written, many people don't realize that about a third of the slave owners were from uh, North from northern states. So there was quite a bit of slavery throughout the northern states as well as throughout the southern states, and many people don't realize that. Um, okay, so we've got the establishment of some other colonies. Uh, we had Roger Williams and Ian Hutchison, who were um, large believers in the separation of church and state. So they and originally in Massachusetts Bay Colony, they were um, supposed to return to England uh, because of these heretical beliefs, but they went and established their own colony uh, in Rhode Island. 
um, based on the separation of church and state, uh, based on religious freedom, based on fair dealings uh, with the Native Americans. Um, he was one of the first abolitionists in, uh, in the United States. Um, Anne Hutchison is well believed in equal rights for women and uh, had her own way of interpreting the Bible and believed that women could, uh, could uh, uh, talk about the Bible and interpret the Bible as well. So they were known as heretics within uh, Massachusetts, but established this more uh, free environment in Rhode Island with the fundamental orders of Connecticut, uh, which were adopted in 1639, um, which gave more voting rights to men and uh, more men in the, the colony were eligible to run for government. Um, since the orders have many of the features of a written constitution, some consider uh, the fundamental orders of Connecticut to be the first constitution in the United States, and thus Connecticut earned the nickname the Constitution State, although some may dispute that. Um, we have Pennsylvania established by William Penn. Again, he drafted the Pennsylvania frame of governance, government. Again, these, these charters that uh, establish governance in the different colonies. Um, this charter ensured freedom of religion, guaranteed all traditional rights enjoyed by English subjects, and created a balance of powers in government to prevent rulers from becoming authoritarian. Um, but in among all of these uh, more progressive I, I instances, we also have I, things such as the Salem witch trials. Um, so not everything was progressive and forward thinking. Of course, during the, the Salem witch trials, more than 200 people were accused um, 19 were found guilty and executed by hanging, and one was pressed to death by, by stones, um, being accused of witchcraft. Afterwards, of course, this was recognized as, a, as an atrocity. Um, I, however, I, back and forth between the colonies and uh, Europe, we have the Age of Enlightenment between the late 1600s and the 1700s, otherwise known as the Age of Reason. Uh, we have here John Locke establishing um, the, uh, the social contract or the social compact idea that government, government needs to be with the consent of the governed. And of course, we had seen that much earlier uh, with the Mayflower Compact. Um, Locke also argued for liberty, religious tolerance, rights to life and rights to property. Um, he was an influential figure on those involved in both the American and the French Revolution, such as Thomas Jefferson, you see here, and, and uh, James Madison. Um, so we have pictured here John Locke, uh, Thomas Hobbes, Immanuel Kant, Sir Isaac Newton, Voltaire, Rousseau, Ben Franklin, and Thomas, Je Thomas Jefferson, some of the leaders of the Age of Enlightenment. Um, the colonial governments, again, were becoming much more uh, sophisticated and established. Um, and yet we had the reign of King George III, who um, originally, of course, the colonies were more uh, uh, I had a hands-off approach or a laissez-faire approach by the monarch uh, back in England, but King George III wanted to establish much more control over the colonies in part uh, to gain, gain a better balance of trade for um, England in the benefit of England and to the detriment of the colonies, and also to uh, establish a lot more taxes on the colonies. We have the Stamp Acts and the tax on tea um, in order to help pay for the wars uh, that had been going on in England. Uh, of course, this led to the Boston Tea Party. Uh, British res Britain responded to this by closing the Boston Harbor and uh, effectively rescinding Massachusetts Bay Colony's right of self-governance, uh, which led to even more uh, resistance by the colonies to British rule. So we had the Continental Congress that, that uh, ruled between 1774 and 1789 and led the uh, the establishment of the governance in the United States and also the, uh, the Revolutionary War. Um, of course, we have the American Revolution between 1775 and 1783. Uh, during that time frame, we have uh, George Mason and James Madison and others uh, establishing the Virginia Declaration of Rights in 1776, which was a precursor to the Declaration of Independence uh, largely penned by Thomas Jefferson, among others, uh, that was um, I signed and uh, in in 17 July 4th, of course, 1776. Uh, some of the primary folks, including uh, Thomas Jefferson, um, others were John Adams, Ben Franklin, John Hancock, um, Samuel Adams, uh, with respect to the Declaration, and. 
establishing again the uh, the um, importance of equality of assent consent of the governed. And you'll notice that they referred to their creator. They did not refer to establishing a Christian governance at that point. There, but they did. Uh, reference religion, but in a very general sense, um, referencing the creator in the Declaration of Independence. We have, of course, the Articles of Confederation, which was the first constitution in the United States. However, uh, that established a very weak central government, and so the government was uh, eventually falling apart. Um, we had uh, the Shays Rebellion. The states were I, I um, balkanized and a threat of uh, the, the United States falling apart. So we had the Constitutional Convention in 1787 uh, by James Madison, um, George Washington, Ben Franklin, Alexander Hamilton, among many others, who looked to both the Enlightenment thinkers, um, but also to for, for uh, forms of governance but also to the Iroquois Confederacy, which uh, was a confederation that um, they uh, based largely, uh, based the US Constitution on the confederation of states or nations in the Iroquois Confederacy. So we have our US Constitution. Again, the Constitution established the separation of powers with checks and balances. It established a representative democracy. Of course, initially it was only 6% of the population, but it was very progressive for the time. And a separation of church and state, as we know. So that, again, establishing that religious freedom right within our constitution. Of course, the constitution did not resolve all issues. We still had the issue of slavery. Uh, we had the three-fifths compromise. Um, Slavery was ultimately resolved by the Civil War. And uh, in addition to the Emancipation Proclamation for the Southern states, uh, finally the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendment um, abolishing slavery and establishing um, equality and the right to vote. Uh, however, even though we have uh, equal protection of laws, we still didn't have equal protection for everyone. Women did not gain the right to vote until uh, 1920. We had, of course, the continuing relationship between the, the concept of manifest destiny and uh, the, the, the settlers and the colonizers uh, basically settling all of the United States across the West, um, leading to, uh, to policies such as the Trail of Tears, the removal of Native Americans. Uh, and we didn't have citizenship, full citizenship for many Native Americans until uh, the Native American Citizenship Act in 1924, so uh, within the, the 1900s and after women had received the right to vote, um, Native Americans, many Native Americans weren't given the right to vote or citizenship until that time. So you can see that the uh, continually, continuing evolving um, constitution and laws I were had their roots in the Mayflower Compact. So this, this right of the consent of the governed, the concept of just and equal laws, this um, concept of religious freedom and being able to, to practice the religion as you choose. And just in our remaining uh, minute, I want to give a nod to um, Alexis de Tocqueville, who wrote Democracy in America, really uh, uh, extolling the fact that not only is democracy well ensconced, but also being amazed at the amount of civic participation within the United States and I uh, exclaiming how much civil society was important in the United States. We see here many examples of organizations um, and civil society and how they continue to, uh, to um, promote freedom, uh, promote equality, promote governance um, to this day. So uh, I want to thank all of you for uh, coming. I see we're at one o'clock now. Um, I'm just going to do a quick uh, uh, nod to our law students. This is what keeps me um, I, I optimistic for the future of our country, that we have so many people who are very dedicated to uh, the rule of law and dedicated to our constitution and dedicated to the freedoms um, that, uh, that we've gone over. Uh, today, I'll do a quick reference to Chief Ju or to Circuit Judge, Eighth Circuit Judge Ralph Erickson, who sent me an um, email when I was first writing on this topic, um, saying how even though some of these issues appear to be very arcane, they're really fundamental and important for all of us 
to, uh, to keep focusing on and remembering our history. So I encourage all of you to study further, um, to share with the next generation uh, about our history. And I wanna thank all of you for joining me on this voyage, uh, exploring the Mayflower Compact and its history and uh, impact on US laws. So thank you very much uh, for attending and, um, and I greatly appreciate your being here. I'll turn the floor back over to our hosts. Um, so it does look like we have a question from the chat here, if you have a moment. Um, sure. let, me, let me pull that up here. And again, I know we're at one o'clock, so anyone who needs to depart, I know this was over the lunch hour, so feel free to, to go. And I thank everyone for coming, but I'm happy to stay afterwards a little bit if, if anyone wants to chat, or I would love to hear your contributions and thoughts as well. So the question that we have from the chat here is, I believe there is some consensus that the earliest known written constitution in America was the Iroquois Great Law of Peace, and that it influenced the governing documents of American democracy. Is there any evidence of the influence of tribal law on the saints, pilgrims, and their governing compacts and laws? Oh, that's an interesting question. I thank you so much for, again, mentioning the Iroquois Confederacy, which again, um, the Iroquois Confederation had a very strong influence on the development of the Constitution. Uh, so Thomas Jefferson, for example, um, even though he was in Europe uh, during the drafting of the Constitution, but he was um, very much involved in all of these conversations back and forth. Um, James Madison and others studied the um, Iroquois Confederacy and studied the, uh, because in, in Europe, um, the only, at the time, the only models for governance were monarchies, right, were, were not, um, not a democracy or a republic. So, so they did very much look to the Native American nations um, and their governance structures for, uh, for their governance. In terms of the pilgrims, the Mayflower Compact, um, I do not believe would have been influenced directly by contact uh, with Native Americans because, of course, they had not landed I, until after the Mayflower Compact was written. Remember, there was threat of a mutiny um, and the strangers, many of the strangers who had the skills uh, to be able to survive in the new world, they were threatening because they had not landed in uh, Virginia where their compact or their charter was. Um, they were threatening to leave and uh, didn't want to just be governed by um, by the the uh, the saints, but so they entered into the Mayflower Compact while they were still on the Mayflower. That's why it's called the Mayflower Compact before anyone was allowed to disembark because they didn't want anyone taking off and leaving. So um, there 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 may have been, of course, there was as I mentioned a lot of interaction between Europeans and the Native American um, tribes and I uh, governance during all of the exploration and the fishing and the other settlements that had occurred. So it may well be that there might've been some writings based on um, the Native American governance structure that had uh, gone back to England that perhaps they might've been aware of. I don't know that, but that, that I suppose that could have happened. Um, but the Mayflower Compact itself was written before they had uh, contact with the, the, the Native Americans. I, I think, however, throughout their treaty negotiations um, and the the uh, interaction, for example, with Chief Massasoit and the Wampanoag, um, they they certainly were learning about the Native American uh, governance structure through those interactions as well. So I'm sure that had um, some type of an impact too. So thank you very much for that question. Are there other questions or I don't comments? I don't see any more in the chat. I don't know if anybody who's still in the room has any questions, um, but it looks like we've covered everything so far. Um, so unless there's anything anyone here wants to add, we'll go ahead and close out. And thank you so much for, um, for presenting for us today and for sharing your expertise on this topic. Great, thank you very much to everyone. It was a real pleasure. Thank you. Have a good afternoon. <laughs>